Well, hello, I am your host, Cliff Wright of Be Inspired Today. And I have a special, a very special guest on today that's going to help you to be inspired to hold on to expectations. She actually is my cousin from Atlanta, GA, ATL, Kena Jackson. Say hello to our audience, Kena. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me, cousin. Well, thank you for being on. I must tell the story about how we connected. Uh, this is a cousin that we both uh, come from the Nicholson Young family. Our great grandparents were brothers and sisters. And uh, so powerful how uh, she connected with me. We've yet to meet uh, in person, but I feel like we have just connected on so many levels. The, the love that Kena shares and she reached out to me about three years ago, and you were such a blessing, Kina, that you helped me connect with family here in California that I didn't know. And uh, we have been, you know, uh, just uh, fellowshipping ever since then, almost three years ago. Uh, Gwen, Lisa, uh, Sheila, uh, Sandra, um, you know, so many others, you know, just, it's just so powerful. So I want to, first of all, um, have you share about your love for family. That's, that's what has stood out to me about you, Kina. Um, so I want you to share, uh, before you do that though, I need to properly introduce you as the owner of J Miles Salon in the Dynamic Metal Loft on Edgewood Avenue in the historic Old Fourth Ward. Uh, you've been the owner of your salon since 2004. But I want to go back to, you know, just talking about your love for family. Um, where did that I, come from? I would say it really started with having parents that met. My parents met at Tennessee State. My mm -hmm. dad was from Dallas. My mom was from Memphis. So we spent a whole lot of vacation time, you know, summertime, Thanksgiving, uh, maybe not so much Christmas due to weather, but we spent a lot of time traveling to Memphis to see my mom's family, to Texas to see my dad's family. Usually in the summer, we were in Texas. Okay. And it was something I always looked forward to. It was like you go through school, you know, but I have this trip to look forward to for Thanksgiving or for Easter or our summer trips, you know, and I always looked forward to connecting with my family that I didn't see on a daily basis. My grandmother didn't live around the corner or, you know, up the street or my aunt, but we did travel to see them. And I always looked forward to that. And then as we got older, you know, in your twenties, you just kind of live in your own life. But, um, and then I had my son, and of course, I wanted him to know his family. Yeah. And and my J Miles is my son's name, Jordan Miles, the name of the salon. Okay. So okay. family is always first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, so I, my dad, and my aunt, and my cousin Dorothy who had started the reunions. I think it was my aunt Juanita and my cousin Dorothy that started the reunions. Okay. They had kind of decided that it was time for the next generation to step up so it doesn't get lost, so it doesn't stop. And I didn't know it, they weren't sharing this with me, but then they encouraged me to host in Atlanta. All right. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's 2015, I hosted in Atlanta and it was the first time that Nicholson Young was hosted by the next generation. So powerful. And it was amazing. Mm. And the connections that were made. Well, first I went to a few reunions before, but you know, I was just participating. I wasn't organizing. So to be on the organizing side and to find how important it is just to stay connected. Yeah. you know, to make things accessible to everyone so we can come together. Um, it was amazing. And since then, 
cousin Dorothy and cousin Al started me on Ancestry and 23andMe, which is how I met you. Yes, because yeah. I did my DNA and I, I did it purposefully right before the New Orleans reunion. So I would have my results to take with me. Okay. okay. And <laughs> I took my results. I didn't, I opened them up and I was like, I don't know these people. Who are these people? <laughs> so I go to New Orleans and I sit down with cousin Dorothy this first night we arrived, the meet and greet. And I say, cousin Dorothy, I said, I did my 23 and me, but I don't really know anybody on there. Okay. And she was like, well, get your iPad. So I pulled it out. She runs down. She was like, that's Freddie's nephew. Freddie was oh, sitting wow. at the same table, by the way. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. Um, that's Ron's niece. That's and, and she's just going down the list. I was like, I'm really related to all these people. <laughs> she said, <laughs> yes, this is your family. And that's when... Um, she said, send them a note. And we sent you a note that moment. Wow. And there was a response. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was everybody that we reached out to that night. They either responded within the next 24 to 48 hours. Okay. So it was just, you know, conversations. Just, you know, first connecting how we're related to understand that we all come, our grandparents, great grandparents, our siblings. Yeah. Now, how deep is that connection? That's deep. That's deep. <laughs> when you think about how you're connected to your own siblings. Yes, yes. And it was like, wow. So these people grew up together, they're siblings, they had a family unit, and then life takes them in different directions. Yes. And we have the opportunity now to come back together. So that was kind of the start of, you know, it, you know, family has always been first for me, but um, I also thought it was very intentional that my father and my aunt did this because I lost my father in 2017 mm -hmm. and I lost my aunt in 2019, the end of 2019 and, um, or 2018, I'm sorry, 2018. And it's been, great that I was given this gift of an extended family, not knowing that I was going to be losing my immediate family so soon. Wow. So there's no loss. There's only, I've only gained. Mm, that's powerful. I've only gained. Yeah. That's yeah. Really powerful. Yes. I mean, the timing of when you connected with me was so powerful as well, because uh, up until we met, uh, I had spent the majority of the holidays with my wife's family because uh, I didn't have much family here in California that I knew of, at, at least at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, when you connected with me, we were at my wife's family reunion. Oh, wow. And, uh, so that following um, Thanksgiving, we had planned to go visit our daughter in New York but uh, no, we were actually going to come to Texas because they were flying to, to uh, Texas for that Thanksgiving. But something came up. We weren't able to go. And then uh, my cousins here, Lisa and all of them, uh, Shay, we all connected on that Thanksgiving. And it was one of the most blessed Thanksgivings I've ever oh. experienced. And I took my brother. And it was so, so many cousins I had never met. And, and like I said, since then, we've just been so close. And, uh, and, it, and it leads me to say this, God has been putting on me uh, this, this message about unscheduled appointments. Mm. And it's, a, it's unscheduled on our calendar, but it's scheduled on God's calendar. And mm. when we attend those unscheduled appointments, like responding to your your message on 23andMe, so many blessings are connected to that. So you were the, 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 that vehicle, that channel that helped me to connect to the family here in um, California. And thanks again so much. So your love for family goes beyond what you probably could ever imagine. Oh, wow. 
Yeah. I, I know it's it works miracles for me. Yes. You know? yeah. It really does. And it helps us, I think, as African Americans, we've been so disconnected for many reasons, you know, due to yeah. work or to move for work or to you know, just many reasons, incarceration, and, and many reasons we've been okay. separated. Yeah. And we have, we are able to reconnect and heal, I believe, mm. because, you know, I don't believe everybody wanted to leave a family behind or leave, you know, that was not their intentions. That's the way life led them. Yeah. You know, but um, I think it's great healing that comes from being able to reconnect now. Yes, yes. After so much separation, so much separation. There's a story, a short story I'm gonna tell you about my great grandfather, Junius Nicholson, yes. was that um, he kind of disappeared at some point from mm -hmm. Texas, from my great grandmother, Minnie. And it was another one of his siblings and gosh, it would take Dorothy to tell me the name because there's so many of them. Right, right. Came to Texas because he wanted to find his family. Hmm. And that's how my grandmother and my aunt were reconnected with the Nicholson family. Wow, amazing. So that was important to him. So, hmm. you know, it's that same, it, it goes throughout our family. It's intentional. It's very intentional that you go out to seek your family and stay connected in some way. Wow, that's so powerful. That's so powerful. I'm, I'm led uh, to have you to give someone some encouraging words that may be you know, alone. Um, they don't know who their family is or they're not connected to their family in, in many ways. Uh, just uh, share, because you said the word healing. And I believe someone wants to be healed. And, and in fact, if you wouldn't mind praying as well. I, to those who are alone, because sometimes I feel I live alone. So I, I feel alone sometimes, but you have to open your heart. You have to be willing and vulnerable mm -hmm. to, and, and for those who don't know their family or they may be feeling rejected or, you know, why weren't they here for me um, to just stay open that we are all work in progress. Our parents were, our grandparents were, and we can learn from them and just stay open, just stay open. There's, I think we carry a lot of burden of disappointment, um, hurt, um, rejection. Um, and we look for, I think, I'll tell you this one thing about my brother, my oldest brother, Sam. Um, there was a point where he had gone through addiction and so forth. And then it was, you know, he was living his life, had gotten clean, was living his life, but he was staying distant. I respected mm -hmm. that. But there was a time that we came together for my father's 70th birthday, I believe mm -hmm. it was his 70th, maybe, maybe 80th or 75, somewhere in there. And what I asked is that everybody participated in whatever manner they could. And when I say everybody, the four, my four siblings, mm -hmm. and he had decided what he was going to bring and he was bringing some food and, you know, me making up a menu. I wanted everything organized. So, you know, but right. everybody had had their part that they were playing in it. Mm -hmm. And one thing he said to me afterwards was, this was so nice. And it wasn't anything extravagant. It was, mm -hmm. I think our first one was a backyard barbecue. The second one, maybe it was his 80th where we went to dinner. Then we went to my other brother's house and just hung out the rest of the day. Okay. But everybody participated in something. Like I was like, you, this is your job. <laughs> you All need right. to right. just bring that one piece to the table. All and right. he said, 
um, how wonderful it was to get together, but how good he felt to participate. Yeah. And it's always better to give than receive. You yeah. get so much when you give. You mm. get so much. So I think I got off subject, but <laughs> no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You're, you're <laughs> with right that being said, right it's, it's um, you know, it's sometimes we have to break out of our own shell and reach out. Um, I didn't want to host in Atlanta. I was like, I don't know how to do this. I've never hosted a reunion. What, what is this? What if I got myself into? And I told my dad was kind of like, you know, it's time for you all to take over. And I was like, oh, somebody else will do it. And mm. in Odessa, everybody was looking at me. And I was like, um, I don't know how to do this. You know, but I took it on and it was it was a very large event. We ended up having 103 family members here in Atlanta. Okay. But it was um, probably one of the most rewarding things I've done in my life. Wow. Um, be, I guess knowing who you are, where you come from, and to see all of our connections, all our similarities... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know it's just like yeah. we are really related <laughs> like sure, we move sure. through the world similar you know we have the same desires our love for music our love for traveling um our love for exploring and i mean it seems like every single family member that i have conversations with i find something that we connect with every single one yes, yes no yes. no matter a first cousin or fifth cousin it's i find this connection that that is you know you know it's nothing but god I'm it's it's it just god has brought us together he's saying that hmm. these families that have been torn apart are being brought back together it's yeah. It, it is, it's amazing. It is amazing. And my parents were divorced when I was 10. So mm -hmm. our connection to Texas had kind of not been as consistent as it mm -hmm. was. So really, as I got older, um, my sister moved to Texas when I was in high school, my senior year of high school. And I would go back to visit her or go to visit her and then kind of reconnected with my aunts and my other cousins, my first cousins. So it was just, I mean, that was amazing, but the reunions were just, oh my gosh. Yeah. They, they just leave you so whole, so whole. And I think that's that, um, what did you call it? The unscheduled appointment? Yes, yes. And I'm I'm so glad that you took on that challenge because otherwise we probably wouldn't have met, you know. So uh it is so powerful just being available, being open, like you said, mm -hmm. to take on a challenge. And uh uh Dorothy, our cousin Dorothy, her and I have been talking about some things as well. And so I, I, I believe that God is taking us to new levels like you said mm -hmm. there is there is a connection a running theme and one of the things i remember was my great grandmother uh, maggie nicholson uh, they had a little uh, store in their house this is in tyler texas where i was uh -huh. born yes and my mother would take me over there you know they would babysit me from time to time her her uh, uh, sons and daughters and they had a, a, a store in the kitchen. Wow. And, and so after school, everybody would come there to buy, you know, candy and whatever else, you know, chips and cookies and all of that sort of thing. So like you said, that, that entrepreneurship is something that I've noticed that is common in our family. Yes. And so I want you to talk about your lifelong dream of owning your own salon. Um, when did you first uh, recognize that was a, a calling in your life? Um, it's interesting because I just love to do hair. 
my whole life. I was doing hair in the kitchen and okay. I'm talking in middle school. I was the person pressing out my girlfriend's hair in the kitchen, <laughs> but I had never been allowed to believe it was a career. That wasn't what I was taught in school. You know, you have mm -hmm. to do these certain things. You have to go there, you go to college. I always thought I wanted to go to law school. I wanted to study psychology, go to law school. And um, I was in college, in and out of college, mostly due to money. Sometimes I was able to enroll, sometimes not. And one year in particular, my brother was working on a movie set. He had started to work on movie sets and they were in Cincinnati filming Rage in Harlem. And okay. I started working with um, he, he just came home one day and he was like, Kina, you do makeup and hair on all your girlfriends for free. He was like, it's a, it's a job. You can make a career out of this. And he was like, just come down to the set. So I went to the set and I met the lead makeup artist on the set and she let me shadow her. Wonderful. That was it. <laughs> That was it. I was like, people actually make money doing this. <laughs> so Something she, you were doing for free. Right. I just love to do. I mean, what what's not better than trying to make people feel good? Oh, so wow. I would um so she invited me to come intern in New York. You know, I just had to pay my expenses to get there. I didn't get paid while I was there, but mm -hmm. that was it. And I Came back to Cincinnati. I rolled in cosmetology school, got my license, and then I came to Atlanta and just never looked back. It. Um, I started. I didn't go back into movies um, because it was. I'd had my son at that point, and mm -hmm. I understood the long hours, and I didn't want my son to be. I just wanted to participate in his upbringing. And I oh, knew yeah. that would be difficult, you know, it would be traveling and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And um, so I started working here, built my clientele. And then I got pushed to have my own salon. Wow. And I kind of started looking at places to rent. And I was like, ah, you know, why am I renting? Why am I improving another property? And then I was like, why can't I buy my own spot? And at that point, I already had my own home. I'd already bought my own home. So I was like, why can't I buy my own spot? And luckily, I had a client that was developing in the historical district. And I had talked to, to her about it because, of course, they do development. And one day, she just came to me and said, you know, I think I have a spot that you, you will be able to purchase a commercial property. Wow. And I was like, wow. So she showed me the renderings when they finally got final approval. And I was all in. And so mm -hmm. I went, met with the real estate agent, put my down payment on. The interesting and the, the walk of faith, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. The walk yeah. of faith was from the time I put my down payment down the building wasn't completed for another four years. <laughs> that was the thing. About being tested. <laughs> and I, I was, you know, it, I almost didn't make it because, I mean, they were, I think they had about $8,000 of down payment. And I, you know, I knew there was a plan, but mm -hmm. I could, I knew there was also a halt for a particular reason. Okay. And um, so the funny thing is, this is nothing but God. So really, when I was like, I need to look elsewhere. So mm -hmm. I called my friend and I said, you know, it's it's been four years. And or no, at this point, it, it had been three years. And I mm -hmm. said, you know, maybe I should look at something else. Do you have anything available? And she said, I absolutely understand. And she said, but will you give me till the end of the week mm -hmm. and before you make your decision? Say we were having this conversation on Monday. Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely. And on Friday, she called me and she said, well, dear, 
I just wanted to call you because when you called me on Monday, I understood we you have had your money in escrow with this project and I knew that we were getting ready to sign off on construction, but she said, I wasn't going to call you until I, I was leaving the bank. She said, I'm leaving the bank now. Construction will start in two weeks. Wow. Mm. <laughs> I said, really? She mm -hmm. said, yes. She said, but I didn't want to tell you anything until it was, you know, a definite, it's a go. She said, I'm leaving the bank. It's, it's done. Construction starts in two weeks. So yeah. there was another year for construction because it's it's a, a loft building. Okay. And so it was about another year before I was able to actually close. Wow. Wow. But um, it was Talk that is faith. That was prayer. And yeah. when I tell you, it was prayer. It was just staying quiet. Um, I was just being a single parent running around get my son to school, doing what I need to do, but focusing on this project. And um, I closed in September of 2004, and it took me three months for the build out, and we opened December 2004. Wow, what a wonderful testimony. I hope uh, someone in the audience uh, really keyed in on Kina's story. Sometimes God will uh, tell you to step out in faith and then it seems like you go into a land of famine <laughs> and that, and you wonder, Lord, did you really tell me to do this? You know, did, is, right. did I really hear from you? And, and so I love the fact that you said that you were just quiet before the Lord. And mm -hmm. that's, that, that really ministers to me because there, there have been times I've had similar situations that I had to just be quiet before the Lord and just let him uh, speak to my heart. And so that's, that's uh, truly amazing. And then I, I wonder how this impacted your son, uh, Jay, uh, Jordan, right? Yes, yes. How, you know, because when we see our parents uh, step out in faith and, 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 and walk in faith and have obstacles, it does something on the inside of us. I watched my mother, she was an entrepreneur as well. But tell us a little bit more about how you think that impacted Jordan's life. Hmm. That's a good question. Considering just this Christmas, we had a conversation about that. Mm. Um, and actually Thanksgiving while we were in Texas. Um, so he, I opened when he was in the sixth grade, I believe, I think he was in the sixth grade mm -hmm. when um, I opened the salon. And of course he, I, I told him this recently, he was, he was a pretty good kid. You know, he kind of stayed on task and I just shared with him, him staying on task allowed me to stay on task. Like we were a team. I was like, I'm gonna need you to get school on point, you know, yeah. athletics and all that, you know, he kind of stayed on point. Um, and it was very helpful to allow me to do what I needed to do. Um, and it allowed me to participate as a parent in his schooling. Um, as much as the salon was a priority, so was he. Mm -hmm. um, to the point, <laughs> I always have to share this story, to the point I would always go on field trips on Monday and Tuesday. My off days have always been Monday and Tuesday. So I, any field trip, I was the parent to volunteer. And I remember there was an exhibit, a Romare Bearden exhibit coming to the High Museum. I think he was in the eighth grade at this point or maybe ninth, I can't remember. And the school was going on a field trip to the High Museum. And I was like, oh, awesome. I've been wanting to see this exhibit. And he said, I said, oh, Jordan, send in a slip to let them know I'm going to, you know, uh, supervise or uh, what do they call it? Um, chaperone. Chaperone. Chaperone on the field trip. And he said, mom, the teacher said that you should let other parents go. <laughs> 
And I said, excuse me? And he said, yeah, the teacher said you need to allow other parents to have an opportunity to chaperone. So me knowing that the teacher did not say that, I said, Jordan, do you not want me to go? And he said, mom, I, we can, we'll, I'll be okay if you're not there. I'll be okay. Uh -huh. And I said, okay, I won't go. <laughs> but I was really upset because I actually wanted to see the exhibit <laughs> for free. <laughs> So I didn't go, but it um, later on, we had this conversation in Texas over Thanksgiving, just, just participating, being able to participate in your children's lives. Being an entrepreneur allows you a little bit more flexibility. I chose my flexibility to be more available to, to school and activities that he had going on. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as he got older, you know, he went, um, went away to college, came back, he was home. And then I, I, I kind of noticed, I felt like he felt like he needed to be where I was, mm -hmm. where I am, where I am today. And I was like, man, don't you remember this journey? <laughs> this has been a long journey. And he actually said while we were in Texas, no, 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 this was at Christmas dinner. He said, because he now has his own, he does credit repair, he, um, he works for Legacy Center, and he has his own, he's doing things in his own way, his own, own way. And um, one of my friends and his wife had come over for dinner on Christmas, and he was like, and Thad was saying, oh, you know, good job, Jordan. And he was like, well, shoot, I watched my mom go from a two-bedroom apartment to owning her own salon. Mm, mm, mm. And I had never heard him say that. Wow. And all I could do was give him a fist bump. <laughs> <laughs> it had me absolutely quiet. Because, wow. you know, they're watching you, but they also, yeah. um, he now he has to figure out his own way. Yeah. And so I, as a parent, whereas, you know, I figure I've, I've gone through all these things. I've made mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. Trust and believe. I've made mistakes along the way. Join the club. <laughs> <laughs> I don't ever want this to sound like it was an easy, easy street because it absolutely was not. Um, remember, mm -hmm. I opened in 2004 and the housing crisis started in 2007. Yes. So that was another you know, faith and my faith was shaken. Mm, mm, mm. It was absolutely shaken. I, I remember telling Jordan at one point that I may have to close. Like we may lose the house. We may lose the salon and we'll just have to start back over. Wow. And what does a little boy, you know, ninth grade, what do you do with that information? And I never thought that could have been a burden to him, but it was mm -hmm. our reality. And I said, we're going to have to tighten up. Mm -hmm. um, my father helped. I really believe my father, my father, God, and my earthly father. Oh, yes. They were in cahoots. <laughs> mm -hmm. And they just, you know, carried me over. But mm -hmm. it's, um, so I have been humbled. There have been times that I wanted to give up. I told my dad at one point, maybe about 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. there are nine commercial spots in my building. I'm one of nine. Wow. From 2008 to, I believe, 2010, all of them were closed except for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, everybody just, there was no retail to be had. There was, nobody was trying to, you know, do anything like that. Um, people were losing their homes in record numbers. Um, and I was just there by myself for two years, paying that mortgage, trying to figure out how to pay that mortgage. Wow. And it was, it was awful. It was mm -hmm. awful. I had clients that were Ivy League graduates from law school and everywhere else who actually lost their jobs never thought they'd be unemployed. Hmm. 
So it was, um, it was tough, but there again, just being quiet with the Lord. I just allowing myself to be vulnerable, to, to work on faith, to, I mean, and it was work. It was work. The people I was surrounded with were mm-hmm. amazing. I mean, absolutely amazing. Even through the pandemic, it's kind of been the same crew that have kept me lifted. But um, mm-hmm. we can't do anything in this world without faith. I can't. Mm-hmm. I can't. God works in the darkest hours. And when I'm feeling like I'm just at the top, all I can do is sing his praises. That's all I want to do. When I'm having like, I'm in a wonderful place, enjoying life, all I can do is praise God. That's all I can do. Because I know when it's at the darkest moments, he is the one there with me. He, I feel his presence. Glory to God. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Kina, you, you touched on some really hot topics. And I want to, first of all, say I, I am so proud to say that you are my cousin. Um, you know, as an African-American single mother, you have accomplished great things. And we know it's because of your, your faith in God and, your, and the love of your son. But I believe that someone is, is listening today that some other young African-American woman um, may be single, she may be married, but she is out there. She, she's taken, she stepped off the boat and walking mm-hmm. on water and now the winds are boisterous. Yes. You keep talking about being quiet before the Lord. Pray for that young person. And it could be a young man as well. Yes. Um, pray for them. Father God, I ask that you speak to anyone listening to this who finds themselves in a trouble space or doesn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. There is light. There is light. We know, God, that you can turn any situation around. We know you can pull us up. I'm a witness of all of your works. I'm a witness of everything that you can do in our lives. Sometimes, Lord, I know we just don't know where to go, who to talk to, how to find our ways way out of certain situations. But I know you offer more grace and mercy than we ever felt we deserved. Lord, lead our children, lead our adults, lead our mothers, our fathers, our children, lead our elders to speak to our children. Let the mothers lead them, help the mothers, the fathers help the fathers be better fathers. Lord, we all are in your grace and in your mercy. Mm. Jesus. Mm. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Oh, Lord. Amen. Amen. You know, um, I'm so glad that the Lord, you know, he just really inspired me. He said, let this podcast be spirit-led. You know, I have my notes, but... Uh, the spirit has definitely stepped up and taken over uh, the interview. You have so many accomplishments that I wanted to, to talk about. So I I need to have you back on the show again and um, really do a part two because so many others have uh, maybe in the midst of what you've gone through four years, you put down $8,000, deposit 
most people would have been there trying to get their money back. <laughs> but you stood on your dream. You stood on your dream and you knew where you wanted to be. And, and I heard you say, this is it. When you found your gift, you you really realized that you could make a living doing what you love to do. Yes. That is so powerful. And I, I am truly inspired an audience. I hope that you have also been inspired to hold on to positive expectations. Do not give up on your dream. Kena Jackson, my cousin, is here. And she is a living witness, a living testimony. I love you, cousin. Thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, I know God has plenty more blessings in store for you in 2022 and beyond. Love you. And thank you for having me, cousin. Thank All right. Any other me. parting words you'd like to share with our audience? Uh, just be inspired. Know that God is infinite in grace and mercy. Amen. Amen. God bless you, cousin. God bless you.